this is going to be the next lesson for the Bible Institute. We've been coming through the Bible, looking at it section by section. Now, we've made it up to one of the greatest parts of the Bible. This is going to be about when the Word was made flesh. Jesus Christ, the living Word, was made flesh. Jesus did not just begin in a manger one day. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. He's the first and the last. Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. And this is when the Word was made flesh. This is when the King of Kings shows up to Israel. So far, we have saw the formulation or development of Israel in Genesis through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and his 12 sons. Then we got into Exodus and we saw the calling out of the nation of Israel. God brought them out of the bondage of Egypt. You see them wander in the wilderness for 40 years in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You get into Joshua and you see them finally go into the land and conquer nations. But not all the nations are conquered. So in Judges, you see enemies rise up against them and God will send them a deliverer when they cry out for help. And those are the judges. And the book of Ruth also takes place during the time when the judges ruled. And then you get into First and Second Samuel. And you're going to see the establishment of the nation of Israel. Because David's going to get on the throne after Saul. And Solomon will get on the throne after David. And the reign of David and the reign of Solomon are the greatest time in Israel's history. And at the end of Solomon's reign, he gets off into idolatry. And his heart's turned away by his wives. He multiplies wives, has so many wives. They're of other uh, nations. They got other gods. So Solomon's heart automatically starts getting turned to other gods. Then this is where you see the beginning of the demise of the nation of Israel. Is when King Solomon did that got off into idolatry, got off into the high places. But then Solomon's son Rehoboam steps on the throne after him and ends up splitting the kingdom. So the kingdom of Israel gets divided and the devil wants to divide and he conquer. He divided Israel so he, and he conquers them. Rehoboam, he splits the kingdom. The southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, would follow Rehoboam and so Rehob uh, Rehoboam's kingdom would end up being called the kingdom of Judah. The ten, southern, to the ten northern tribes followed Jeroboam, which would be called the kingdom of Israel. So Israel is split. You got the one side, the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom. Then you got the other side, the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom. And Jeroboam, the king of Israel, makes his own religion. And this false religion where they worship golden calves, completely satanic, completely idolatrous. It sticks with Israel pretty much from then on. All the kings you see from Israel, pretty much after that you see king after king walking in the ways of Jeroboam. It talks about how they departed not from the sins of Jeroboam. And the same way that David is the standard for a good king, you got all the wicked kings compared to Jeroboam. And it mentioned him over and over again. And this is the demise of the nation of Israel. All that idolatry that comes in. All the forsaking God that they do. That's the demise of Israel. And you eventually see Israel and Judah go into captivity. And this is the destruction of Israel. See the Old Testament. If you can get that outline there. The formulation of Israel. The calling out of Israel, the establishment of Israel, the demise of Israel, and the destruction of Israel. You've, you've got a quick little outline for your Old Testament. Because that's what it's about. It's about God dealing with Israel. God moving in one way to establish Israel. And they reject Him back then as well. And then you get into the New Testament. Israel's been kicked off the throne since 606 B.C. They lost the kingdom. Now we're going to see when the Lord comes down in the flesh to offer both kingdoms to Israel. 
And you already know what they did with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. He's the King of Kings. He's coming down to Israel to offer both kingdoms. And it says in John 1.11, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. So He was not received. And in Matthew 15.24, He said He is not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's who Jesus was going to when He showed up. And during the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, He's not preaching to the church today. He's preaching to Israel. And when Jesus Christ came, you are still doctrinally in the Old Testament because the New Testament didn't start until the death of the testator. So when you're reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when you're reading those, you can plainly see you're still doctrinally in the Old Testament. And God is still, it's still God dealing with the Jews. Jesus was sent not to, but into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And the New Testament doesn't officially begin until Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. It says in Hebrews 9, 16 through 17, for, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. You see that? There must also of necessity be the death of the testator, where a testament is. A testament is a force after men are dead. The New Testament does not officially begin until Jesus Christ dies on the cross. So what you have in the Gospels is you're still doctrinally Old Testament. And it even says that the Lord Jesus Christ was made under the law. He came to fulfill the law. In Matthew 5, 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus Christ did every single thing a man would have to do to be considered righteous. He kept all that perfectly. He is the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the ending. He didn't just begin in a manger. He chose to leave heaven and come down in likeness of sinful flesh to die for the sins of the whole world die for every sin ever committed in the past, the present, and the future. And Israel has been under the bondage of Rome for hundreds of years. Just like in Exodus, they had been under the bondage of Egypt for hundreds of years. Back then, the Lord sent Moses. Now, with them under the bondage of Rome, he's going to send the prophet like unto Moses. This would be the promised seed all the way back in Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15, it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. The devil's been attacking the seed ever since he heard this in an attempt to keep it from coming. But the promised seed shows up, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the prophet like unto Moses. And the devil can't stop the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew 1, 23, it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. There's your promised seed. This is God in the flesh, made of a woman. Galatians 4, 4 says, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. When he came, you're still dispensationally under the law. And the woman just happened to be in the line of David, which is the tribe of Judah, where he was made of a woman. That woman just happened to be in the line of David, which is the tribe of Judah. And that's why Revelation 5.5 5 calls Jesus Christ the line of the tribe of Judah. And the book of Matthew takes you through the life of Jesus Christ very well. So I want to show you when the Word was made flesh, the life of and ministry of the Lord Jesus, I want to sh show you by looking at the outline of the book of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 1, it shows you that Jesus Christ is in the kingly line. So in Matthew chapter 1, you see the genealogy of the king. This is very important. Because what's the Bible about? It's about kings and kingdoms. 
the promised seed, the Lord Jesus, is the King of Kings. It says in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So Jesus Christ concerning the flesh, he's the son of David. He's the son of Abraham. In Romans 1, 3, it says, Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. That's so important. He's in the kingly line. Jesus Christ is the virgin-born, sinless son of God. And his mother, his earthly mother, Mary, was in the line of David. Joseph, his foster parent, not his father, his foster parent, is also in the king's line. That's amazing. Both of them are in the king's line. After the king named Jeconiah, back there in, in the Old Testament, the king Jeconiah, after him the Lord said that no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David, ruling any more in Judah. Jeconiah was so evil, that's what the Lord said, that no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. And that would have been a problem. But the Lord Jesus beat out this problem because of the virgin birth. Since he was virgin born, he was not included in this curse that was placed on Jeconiah's seed. It says in Jeremiah 22, 28 through 30, Is this man, Coniah, that's Jeconiah, a despised broken idol? Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Wherefore are they cast out, he and his seed, and are cast into a land which they know not. O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Write ye this man childless. A man shall not prosper, a man that shall not prosper in his days. For no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David, and ruling any more in Judah. But the curse here on Jeconiah's line does not apply to Jesus Christ because the virgin birth beat it out. So the virgin birth, such an important doctrine. You have to believe the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. If, he, if he's not virgin born, then he had this curse on him and he couldn't be your king. The virgin birth is key. It says in Matthew 1, 1 through 2, it says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. See that? He's the... From the line of Judah, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And you know what it says about Judah? And Genesis 49, 10, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. You see that? The scepter shall not depart from Judah. A scepter is what a king has. The king comes from the line of Judah. So Jesus Christ, he's the son of David. He's in the kingly line. He's the son of Abraham. He's in the tr from the line of Judah. Jesus is from the tribe of Judah and Mary's line, from the tribe of Judah and his foster daddy's line. And he's the son of the king in the godly line. He hits the bullseye all the way around. And since he was virgin born, the curse on Kaniah's line doesn't apply to him. You just can't beat him. He wins all the way around. So in Matthew chapter 1, you see, you saw the genealogy of the king. You saw it laid out how he is king. He's from the son of David. He's the son of Abraham. He's the line of the tribe of Judah. In Matthew chapter 2, you see the birth of the king and where he's born. It describes how he is born in Bethlehem of Judea. But Matthew doesn't get into the birth like Luke does. It actually goes forward in time a few years to when the king is a young child and you have three wise men bringing him three gifts and you know what they're looking for? A king. In Matthew chapter 2 and verse 2, they were saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. They were looking for a king. So one day, probably on September 23rd, there were some shepherds 
watching over their flock, and all of a sudden an angel appears. And you can read about this in Luke chapter 2, Luke 2, 8 through 11. It says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. A Savior was born in the city of David to a woman from the line of David. This is the king. That's the birth of the king. That's what you see in Luke chapter 2. You see the birth of the king. You saw it a little bit in Matthew as well. Matthew chapter 2. In Matthew 3, you got John the Baptist shows up as the voice of one crying in the wilderness and announces the king. So in Matthew 3, you got the announcement of the king. In John 1, 29, he says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John knew who he was. The ministry of John starts a transition. We're, we are going to now transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament with the ministry of John and the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. It says in Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. So, John shows up. It says the law and the prophets were until John. Right there, that shows you plain divisions in the Bible. You got the law and the prophets being until John. So, that shows you there's a time before the law. Then you got a time where they're under the law, and then... The law and the prophets were until John. So right there's some plain divisions for people who do not believe there's any divisions in the Bible in any way. Right there shows you plain divisions of God dealing with people in different ways. And even though God does not change, how he deals with people obviously changes. So John shows up and he's, he's baptizing. He's John the Baptist. Do you know why John was baptizing? Well, it says in John 131, he says, And I knew him not, but that he should be manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. John was baptizing so that he could manifest Jesus Christ to Israel. He's the forerunner of Jesus Christ, and he wants Israel to accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah. So you see how this dispensation is to Israel. Over and over again, I'm going to show you how the, the time of the earthly ministry of Jesus, it's to Israel. And that's why when you look at the Gospels, you got all these people going to the Gospels to, and, and ta they're taking the verses from the Gospels and they're putting those ahead of the Pauline epistles when Paul is the minister to the Gentiles in its church age doctrine that's primarily for us today, they're wanting to go back to Matthew, Mark, and Luke to get doctrine and override what Paul said. And that's why you got people coming up with they can lose their salvation and teaching just crazy things. They're going to the book of Matthew many times. They want to teach you can lose your salvation. They want to teach lordship salvation and just have fouled up doctrine. It's because they're going to the book of Matthew and they're taking things that Jesus said to Israel and putting it on the church. So Matthew chapter 3, you got John baptizing with water and his ministry is to manifest Jesus to Israel. He's the forerunner of Jesus Christ. And in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus Christ defeats the heavyweight champion of the spiritual realm, Satan himself. This chapter shows you the temptation of the king. Chapter 1, you had the genealogy of the king. Chapter 2, you had the birth of the king. Chapter 3, you got the announcement of the king. Chapter 4, you got the temptation of the king. Satan had the power of death according to Hebrews 2.14. He's the one who led Adam to bring death into the world. The first man, Adam, brought death into the world, but the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to bring life. And he had the, the devil. He, had, he was in charge of the kingdoms of this world after he ruined the nation of Israel. 
God let him be in power over the kingdoms of this world. Remember, and he's all these Gentile nations, these wicked Gentile nations, the devil had it all set up to when Jesus Christ showed up, the whole world was lying in wickedness. And he set up all the major false religions during that time after Israel lost the kingdom. And he had the charge of the kingdoms of this world after he ruined the nation of Israel. This is how he could say to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, I will give thee all these things if thou wilt fall down and worship me in Matthew 4, 9. Remember that Lucifer at one time had a throne and as the God of this world, as it calls him in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, he desires worship. And he would have loved to get worship from the King of Kings. However, Jesus Christ pulled out a verse of Scripture and said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And this time, the devil would face a foe, a foe of his, that was a lot different than Adam, a lot different than Abraham, and a lot different than the kings of Israel and Judah. This was the King of Kings. And he has... God's blood in his veins. He is God manifested in the flesh according to 1 Timothy 3.16. Jesus Christ defeats the devil and leaves the mount of temptation with the crown to the kingdom of heaven and the crown to the kingdom of God. Now he can complete the commission given to Adam who previously lost the crown. At one time, Adam had the crown to the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. He was... Uh, he had the kingdom of, crown of the kingdom of God because he was made in the image and likeness of God. He had the crown of the kingdom of heaven because he was given dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowls of the air and everything on the earth. But he lost the crowns because the Luc Lucifer showed up, tempted him and Eve in the garden, and they sinned. He had the commission given to him to be fruitful and multiply, but he, he lost the image. So everybody that he that came from him had sinful blood in their veins. He could have, if Adam never sinned, he would have been fruitful and multiplied to have millions and millions and millions of children that were able to replace the sons of God that fell. And it would have been a, just a perfect world. No sin. But when he comes, uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords at the second coming, the increase of his government and kingdom shall see no end. It will continue to multiply through the millennium and eternity. And this has to do with the kingdom of heaven, which is physical. Jesus Christ is going to perfectly, completely fulfill the commission that was given to Adam to be fruitful and multiply. Adam was fruitful and multiplied, but it was sinners multiplying. The king of kings shows up, and he's multiplying righteously, a righteous seed. You see, right now he's doing it spiritually speaking because uh, many saints are born into the family of God. And those are righteous because they got the righteousness of Jesus Christ. This is only made possible by Jesus Christ. When you get saved, you go out and tell other people how to be saved, and they get saved, you're being fruitful and multiplying. If it wasn't for Him, we couldn't do that. If it wasn't for Him, we couldn't become the sons of God. He is the, he's, he's the one that's able to restore the image that Adam lost. Adam lost the image of God when he sinned. But when you get saved, you're born again, you, get, you can get the image of God back. This has to do with the kingdom of God that is spiritual. So in Matthew chapter 4, you got the temptation of the king where he defeats the, the, un, uh, the undisputed heavyweight champion, the devil, who's got the power of death. He's got all the kingdoms of this world, and he's able to give them out to whomsoever he will. But then he gets defeated by the Lord and the Lord Jesus Christ, king of both kingdoms. He's got the crown to the kingdom of heaven and the crown of the kingdom of God. So in Matthew 5 through 7, you got the constitution for the kingdom. You got the constitution for the millennial kingdom in Matthew 5 through 7. And in Matthew 5 through 7, this is where everybody wants to go to get their doctrine. You'll find when you go, just go to any church, 
man, they really hang around Matthew 5 through 7. They think Matthew 5 through 7 is more important than the Pauline epistles. You mentioned Paul. They say, yeah, I like Paul, but Jesus, he's so much better. You got to go to the red letters. You got to go to the Beatitudes. You, and they think, they think that Jesus, when it, Jesus on earth in the flesh, they think what Jesus said on earth in the flesh is more important than the Old Testament, more important than Pauline's epistles, more important than all the parts of the Bible, because they see what Jesus said in the red letters when he's on the earth in the flesh. They think that that's the most important thing in the Bible. But think about it. You go to the Old Testament, what's wrote down, that's Jesus. You go to Pauline's epistles, that's not just Paul, that's the Lord Jesus. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So it's not just the red letters that are the Lord Jesus. All the Bible is Jesus. And you have to remember when reading Matthew that this isn't doctrinally to the church. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 gives you the constitution for the kingdom. Jesus Christ had come to offer both kingdoms to the Jews, and if they would have received them, they would have been in the kingdom long ago. And here are some verses that plainly show that Matthew 5 through 7 is a completely different dispensation entirely. And the Lord is going to say in Matthew chapter 5, the Lord's going to say that someone is blessed for doing something and for being a certain way over and over. For example, Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all men of evil against you falsely for my sake. You see, all these things will be true in the millennium because Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, will be sitting on the throne and enforcing these things to be true. With someone's meek, they're going to inherit the earth because Jesus Christ is on the throne. He's going to make that happen. Those that mourn are going to be comforted. Those that are poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. With Jesus on the throne, uh, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. You know, God, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he sits on the throne, he's going to enforce all these things to happen. All these things aren't happening right now. People today who take these promises and apply them to today you know what they do? They come out talking about peace and world peace and having peace, but they got their dispensations crossed. There's not going to be any of this true peace until the Prince of Peace shows up. None of these things are going to happen until Jesus Christ is sitting on the throne and he's enforcing the rules. Then the pure in heart are going to see God. And then you look at Matthew 5, 29, 30. It said, where the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. That's obviously for the millennium. Because if... When a lost sinner dies today, it's not his whole body being cast into hell. It's his soul. In the millennium, you don't line up with righteousness. You don't line up with what the Lord Jesus Christ says. Your whole body, you can be cast bodily into a lake of fire, into hell. And There's going to be a literal, the book of Isaiah talks about how there's going to be a literal, visible, physical lake of fire on the earth as a deterrent to crime where people can be cast bodily into it. That's not going on today. That's, this is a completely different 
world you're looking at, completely different dispensation. Matthew 5, 39 says, But I say unto you that you resist not evil, and, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel to go, thee to go with a mile, go with them twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from, the, from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. That's obviously not for today. If that's for today, then you send me, go ahead and send me all the money in your bank account. If that's for today, you could be able to ask me, to, all these people on the side of the road could ask me to give me, give them all, all the money I got in my pockets. I'd have to give them that money. It says, from him that asketh thee, turn not thou away. You see, when you get into the millennium, people's going to be righteous. I mean, there's still going to be sin going on, but people's going to be righteous. And it's just going to be a, a, a different world that you're living in. Matthew 16, it says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Is that for today? Are you seeing his will being done on earth? as it is in heaven? No, but you will in the millennial kingdom. It says, Thy kingdom come. When his kingdom come, comes, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 5 through 7, it's for the millennial kingdom, the constitution for the kingdom. He says in Matthew six fourteen through 15, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's not for today. My forgiveness is not based on me forgiving somebody else. My forgiveness is based on, I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that took care of my sins, past, present, and future. If I confess, and then after I'm saved, if I confess my sins, He's faithful and just forgive me for my sins, for my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. It's not based on if I forgive others around me. And people love to take that verse, say that you're having a hard time forgiving somebody for something. They'll say, well, your father's not going to forgive you your trespasses and you're going to die and go to hell if we're not forgiving somebody else. See, they'll take these verses like that and they'll shove them onto you today in the, in the church age. So in Matthew 5 through 7, you noticeably see that Jesus is talking about a future kingdom. And he's given the constitution for that future kingdom. And where the righteous people are going to be blessed. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. It's something completely different. And then Matthew 8 through 9, you got the miracles of the king. In these chapters, you'll see the king has power to heal, calm the storm, cast out devils. He had everything he needed to fulfill every prophecy about him in the Old Testament. And see, who's he going to? He's going to Israel. What does 1 Corinthians one twenty two say? The Jews require a sign. What does he show up with? The signs. Just like when Moses showed up to Israel back there in Exodus, what did the Lord ha have him do? Signs. Turn the rod, turn into a snake. Pick up the snake, put your hand to your bosom, it turned to leprosy, take it out, it's healed. Parting the waters. You know, Israel started with signs, the prophet like unto, the, like unto Moses. Jesus Christ, the king, shows up. What's he got? He's got the signs to Israel. 1 Corinthians one twenty two. the Jews require a sign. So you got the miracles of the king in Matthew 8 through 9. You get to Matthew 10, he calls out the 12 apostles. He also gives them power to do miracles. And during the Lord's earthly ministry in the book of Acts, you have the signs of an apostle. This is something that you don't have in our current dispensation. This is because the signs are to Israel. And today, God isn't dealing with Israel, so there's no need for the sign gifts. There's no need for the signs of an apostle. Today, Israel is blind in part because they rejected the preaching of John the Baptist. They rejected the preaching of Jesus. They rejected the preaching of the apostles. And finally, the preaching of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. And God began to deal with the Gentiles. And we are in the church age now. 
and we're operating by faith, not by sight. If I was seeing all these apostles that had the signs of an apostles all the time walking around, confirming the word with signs following, I'd be operating by sight a lot more. In Matthew 10, 1, it says, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. These are the signs of an apostle. And the signs of an apostle was to confirm the word of God to the Jews by being able to back up those words by doing something supernatural. Because it, 1 Corinthians one twenty two, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. The fact that you got the signs of an apostle going on in the book of Matthew and in the Gospels, that shows you you're dealing with a completely different dispensation, completely different time period going on here. And dispensation is not a period of time, but dispensations will take place during certain periods of time. So that's why you see many people, they say a dispensation is a period of time, and I don't look too much into that, because the dispensations, certain dispensations, happen during certain periods of time. Dispensation is God dispensing something. That's all it is. And God dispenses His grace differently throughout the Bible. God dispenses different things to different people in the Bible. And what you're dealing with in Matthew, completely different dispensation going on. And it, I don't know how you can't see that. You got... Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh on the earth and he's given these signs of an apostle to the disciples and they're going around doing these supernatural things. That's something that God doesn't do today. And in Mark 16, it really lays out these signs of an apostle. Mark 16, 14 through 20, it said, Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs, notice the signs, who requires a sign. 1 Corinthians one twenty two. the Jews require a sign. They started with signs in Exodus 4 with Moses. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after... The Lord had spoken unto them. He was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Notice that. Confirming the word with signs following. Also remember in Matthew 10 who he tells the disciples to go to. In Matthew 10, 5 through 6. These twelve sent Jesus sent forth and commanded them saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You see that? That's just as plain as the nose on your face. Go not into the way of the Gentiles, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This shows you that during the earthly ministry of Jesus, they were primarily going to Israel. Just as today, the Lord is primarily going to Gentiles. Matthew 10, 7 through 8. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. So they weren't going around preaching, Jesus Christ is going to die on the cross for your sins. They were preaching about the coming kingdom. And if they would have accepted the message, they would have, they would have gotten the kingdom. They weren't going around saying that Jesus Christ is going to die on the cross for your sins, be buried and resurrected yet. Because when Jesus said that to the disciples, they didn't even understand what he was talking about. There's places where Jesus explains to them his death, burial, and resurrection. And it says, they understood it not, and the saying was hid from them. Neither understood they the things which were spoken. Now notice also, they're going to the Jews. And they got the signs connected with their preaching. The healing the sick cleansing the lepers, raising the dead, casting out devils. They had these signs to confirm the word because they were going to the Jews who require a sign. Then in Matthew 11 through 12, you got the kingdom rejected. 
But within these chapters, you're going to see how the king is rejected. They say he does his miracles through Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And this is where you got the famous um, verses about uh, them saying, you know, them committing the unpardonable sin and whatnot. And people want to take that about the unpardonable sin and apply it to people today. They say if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, then you can never be saved and you lose your salvation. You see how dangerous it is to go to Matthew and take um, things back there and shove it on you today. If, you, if there is an unpardonable sin today, then the gospel isn't just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's don't commit the unpardonable sin before you're saved and then believe on Jesus Christ. You see how that, just that, adds something to the simple gospel. You can't commit the that same sin that they committed back there in Matthew chapter 12. That was a sin that could only be committed when Jesus Christ was on earth in the flesh. There is no unpardonable sin that you can commit today. If there was, then your salvation has a work involved. You would have to abstain from that unpo certain unpardonable sin... And believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's not so. To be saved, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It don't matter what you did before you were saved. And in Matthew 13 through 25, you got the parables of the king. Because of their rejection, you're going to see the Lord preach about the kingdom in parable form. And in Matthew 16, in this chapter, the Lord gave the keys of, to the kingdom of heaven to Peter. In Matthew 16, 18 through 19, it says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, the rock is Jesus, not Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He gives Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And that's significant, and we'll go more into that later. And in Matthew 24, you see the Lord's great end-time sermon when the disciples ask Him, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And if you don't believe, if you're still not convinced that Matthew is directed toward Israel, surely Matthew 24 will convince you of that. You get into this end-time sermon and you plainly see that the Lord is speaking to Israel and not to the church. For example, Matthew 24, 20, he says, But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day? I mean, you don't keep the Sabbath. Paul said that no man judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of the holy day or of the new moons or of the Sabbath days, which a shower of the things to come but the bodies of Christ. He's talking about the Sabbath day. That's because after the rapture, you get into the time of the end, the tribulation, the it goes back to dealing with Israel once again. That's why you got it called the time of Jacob's trouble. And their, the Sabbath comes back. And that's why he says, Pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Matthew 24, 30, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then sh shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory if you're dealing with the church age here what's this about all the tribes um people they don't rightly divide matthew 24 what happens they think it's talking about them they come up with the post-trib pre-wrath rapture they don't believe in the pre-tribulation rapture that god that god's going to get the church out before any of it, the tribulation begins, they think you're going to go through the first part and then that the last part's just the wrath. And they get that from Matthew 24 because they do not want to believe that Matthew is to Israel and not to the church. Matthew chapter 25, you got the great chapter that shows you the Lord separating the sheep from the goats 
at the judgment of the nations. Matthew 26, you got Judas betraying Jesus. You got the Lord's Supper. You got Jesus' agony in the garden, his betrayal and arrest. Matthew 27, you got his mocking crucifixion and burial of the Lord Jesus. Matthew 28, you got the resurrection and great commission. As you can see, the Gospel of Matthew shows you Jesus Christ the King. So you find right out of the gate it showed you Jesus Christ in the kingly line. Then you get to the Gospel of Mark, it shows you Jesus Christ the servant. So Mark doesn't have a genealogy because a servant doesn't have one. The Gospel of Luke shows you Jesus Christ as son of man. Luke is a beloved physician, as Paul calls him, so God got a medical doctor to write about the Savior's birth. The Gospel of John shows you Jesus Christ the Son of God. So it starts with, in the beginning was the Word. It didn't start by tracing him back to Abraham. It started with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Because the Gospel of John shows you Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So these four Gospels cover the life of the Lord Jesus from his birth to his resurrection. And primarily it covers his life as he walked on the earth during his public ministry, which was only around three and a half years. So what you're getting in the Gospel from the perspective of is from the perspective of four different guys that God spoke through. Remember, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There were other Gospels that was written, but these are the ones that God chose to be in His Bible. And they end with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and then you get into the book of Acts. And you got to get the book of Acts right. Because most of the false doctrine today with the false cults, the false religions and stuff, they take stuff out of the book of Acts and they completely take it out of context. They shove it on you today when, once again, the book of Acts, you're in a transition. Going into the book of Acts, the nation of Israel has already rejected Jesus Christ when they rejected the preaching of John the Baptist. They've already rejected Jesus Christ when they crucified him. And now they're going to reject him again when they reject the preaching of the apostles all the way up until Acts 7 with the stoning of Stephen. See, what you had in the Gospels was a transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The New Testament started with the death of the testator. Now, with the book of Acts, it is another transition. It's going to go from God dealing with the Jews and to God dealing with the Gentiles, who will primarily make up the church. And the nation of Israel is going to become blind in part to the truth of the Lord Jesus. And that is where they're at today. They're blind in part. The book of Acts is all about the Acts of the Apostles. Before the Lord went to the third heaven, He told the Apostles to confirm the word with signs following. And this is what you see through the book of Acts. 1 Corinthians 1.22 says the Jews require a sign. Israel still had a chance to receive Jesus Christ as who He said He was. And in turn, they would get both kingdoms that were being offered to them. They would get the spiritual kingdom of God by trusting in Christ. They would get the physical, physical kingdom of God by trusting in Christ. And the signs that would the apostles had were to confirm the word with signs following. And you see today, you have all these people pretending and claiming to have the power to heal, to speak in tongues, to cast out devils. They're claiming they got these signs that the apostles had. They'll go back to the book of Acts. They think that they can shove that on them today, for them today. And then you got the very few who claim to be able to take up serpents and even... A, even fewer, if any at all, claim to be able to drink any deadly thing, which you don't hardly ever see. That sign gift being counterfeited, because that one's the hardest one to counterfeit. The ones that are harder to fake, like taking up serpents and drinking deadly things, are the ones you see the least. What you see the most is the faith healing and the speaking in tongues. But they claim to be apostles. They claim to have these signs that the apostles had. Once again, all this amounts to is people getting their dispensations crossed. God doesn't need signs of the apostles today. He doesn't need apostles running around with sign gifts today because it's the Jews that require a sign, according to 1 Corinthians 1.22. Just like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14.22 that tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. You have to get this. This will clear up a whole bunch of nonsense they throw at you today. That the signs of the apostles... The things that the apostles were doing, you can't do today. You're not an apostle. Paul was the last one of the apostles. 
And if you don't get this right, you'll have people making you doubt your salvation because you don't speak in some jibber-jabber language that they've made up that has absolutely nothing to do with the tongues in the Bible. But what you have at the beginning of the book of Acts is the Lord continuing to offer both kingdoms to the Jews. And this is why they asked the Lord in Acts chapter 1, if they ask him this question, remember this, this is a key for the book of Acts. Look at what they ask him in Acts 1, 6 through 7. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, without this time restore again the kingdom to Israel. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Lord hath put in his own power. He didn't say that he wouldn't restore the kingdom to Israel. You know why? Because it was still possible for them to accept him. He avoids the question because it's still on the table. Maybe they will accept him. Of course, the Lord knows he can see that they're not going to. But still, that's not how the Lord operates. It's still on the table. So he doesn't answer the question. And in Acts, who do you see be doing most of the preaching to the Jews? Peter. And remember, the Lord gave him the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So in the first part of the book of Acts, who do you see doing most of the preaching? It's Peter. He gave uh, Peter had gotten the keys to the kingdom of heaven given to him in Matthew 16. And in the first part of Acts, he's going to them preaching Jesus Christ to them with the hopes they will accept him and the king will come. Peter preaches five messages to Israel in Acts 1 through 6. In Acts 1, 15, 2, 14, 3, 12, 4, 19, and 5, 29, he preaches five messages to Israel. They reject then in Acts 7, Stephen preached that great message. It's basically an overview of the history of Israel all the way up to the point where they crucified Jesus. He, he says in Acts 7.51, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. He said in Acts 7, 54 through 57, when they heard these things, it, sa it says this here, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. Jesus Christ was standing because if they would have accepted the preaching of Stephen, Jesus Christ would have come back then. But what, what did they do? They rejected him. And after Acts 7, you see it plainly switch from God dealing with the Jews to God dealing with the Gentiles. Plainly. It's a plain switch. The book of Acts is a transition from God dealing with Israel to God dealing with the Gentiles who make up primarily make up the church. In Acts chapter 8, the Samaritans who are half Jew, half Gentile, there's a revival at Samaria. And you also have Philip leading the Ethiopian eunuch to the Lord. Guess what? Ethiopian eunuch, Gentile. Acts chapter 9, Saul, who, who you know as the Apostle Paul, he gets saved. And guess what? He's the Apostle to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 10, you got Cornelius, an Italian, a Gentile, gets saved. Acts chapter 11, Peter recounts the story of him leading Cornelius to the Lord and convinces the Jews. And look what they say in Acts eleven eighteen. 18. When they heard these things, they held their peace they, and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. And then Acts 12 through 20, you see Paul's missionary journeys to who? The Gentiles. Paul went to the Gentiles. He said himself that he was the apostle to the Gentiles. In Romans eleven thirteen. he says, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. And look who he said Jesus was minister to, Romans 15, 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. So you see that? Plainly a switch in the book of Acts. It's a transition book. God going from dealing with the Jews to dealing with the Gentiles who primarily make up the church.